land is strewn with ankle twisting brushwood and stumps left by modern forestry felling. The information panel tells of a more serious hazard. Danger, explosives, no access. This is rural Merionath, 60 years after the Royal Artillery ceased using Kumkine as a firing range. On Otterburn training area, a forward operating base built as though it were in Afghanistan watches out over the sheep and sedges. <coughs> Nearby, a stone tent, which is an abandoned farm repurposed as a troop shelter, masquerades as just another farm building until you get closer and see the military signage. We can treat militarised as a layer that's added to the rural landscape. We can recognise it as a bounded assemblage of materials and institutional rules that are put to work by the military in order to make the landscape suitable for training troops and weapons. It comprises the signs and the shells, the Afghan base, the farm redefined as tent. This is only a partial understanding. It doesn't give much sense of the ways that the materials and the practices in landscapes are transformed over the long term nor does it capture the interplay of different agencies and materials, of military and civilian. We will argue that militarisation is not a process that is purely in the control of or conditioned by the military. It's co-constituted through the materials and actions of military and rural populations alike. Our paper is a dialogue between the two case studies that we opened with, and we'll use this dialogue as a way to describe militarised rurality. <laughs> okay. uh, so there are many different ways to define the Otterburn training area if you look at it as an artefact in its own right. I mean, to start with, it's just 58,000 hectares of northern high moorland and rough hill country. It's grown to this estate from an initial purchase of 10,000 hectares in Reedsdale down here in 1911. Uh, this central live, uh, yeah. So the central live firing area is here and there is a buffer of a dry training area where pyrotechnics are used, which protects surrounding communities. Um, unlike in the military camps of my imagination, certainly, there are no high fences or razor wire. The area is bounded by roads and a Scottish border with prominent warning signs and red flags flying to warn against entrance during training exercises. Although 30,000 troops train here every year, up to 1,600 at a time, and it's the second most significant training estate in Britain, it's not just a military landscape. It's a farming landscape with 31 tenant farms, which are the black subdivisions on the map. It's a working landscape with civilian employees and contractors doing all the day to day. It's a recreational landscape entirely within the Northumberland National Park and road-based recreation like cycling in the live training area and off-road like rambling and community archeology span in the dry training area. And this always intensifies during landing season in the spring. And it's also an archaeological landscape, with those yellow dots are the 604 confirmed archaeological features, there are 74 scheduled monuments, and well-preserved relic landscapes, mostly from Neolithic to the Second World War. So, 170 miles to the southwest of Otterburn, Trosvunath training area in southern Snowdonia was established in the Military Manoeuvres Bill, 1900. This is my um, best Marquess of Lansdowne voice. For those of you that don't know your um, political history, he was Secretary of State for War when the bill was brought in. Um, Our soldiers are sometimes reproached for a want of resource and of power to adapt their tactics to the country in which they are operating. But that's hardly a matter for surprise, seeing that all their instruction and training takes place in areas and at rifle and artillery ranges with every yard and feature of which they are perfectly familiar. So aside from its remoteness and lack of familiarity to most troops, the character of the Trosvenith landscape played a role in determining its choice as the location for the range. The low rolling hills and the hidden valley of Kumkine formed perfect training for the new tactics which had evolved during the Boer Wars of long range artillery barrage beyond line of sight. The use of kraal for sheepfold on the early range maps might be an indication that the Ordnance Corps surveyors or draftsmen 
were veterans of that four of those one of the late four conflict. The ranges were relatively compact, covering just over three thousand hectares and very briefly extending to over five thousand. And their active use lasted only until 1957. As the military left, their camp was occupied by construction workers who began building the nuclear power station at Trosvenet. Kumkine, which lay at the core of the range, was abandoned, and work did not begin to clear the ordnance for a further four decades, and large areas remain a danger zone. During our five years field work in the training area, we took a particular interest in the militarised landscape. Primarily using landscape survey and arch archival research, we began building a narrative understanding of how the landscape was appropriated and shaped through military training, and how militarisation changed its perception and historical trajectory of the rural landscape. <clears throat> So in, in my fieldwork too, um, I also aim to explore how the process of militarization took place. Um, and I was using this very simple definition because militarization is sometimes used <coughs> as a pejorative term. But what it simply means is using things to, do, to achieve military goals. So on the OTA, <coughs> existing archaeological features are transformed to achieve specifically military ends from the physical, like providing shelter, targets and obstacles, to the ideological like demonstrating the MOD's role as protector of the nation's heritage as well as defender of the realm. Um, archaeologists <coughs> and military geographers have identified classes of material culture whose presence and absence can be read as indicators of this militarization process. So obviously the presence of any military objects like weapons, vehicles, buildings, ration packets is a very clear sign but the absence of other objects is also important, like civilian artefacts, but particularly domestic artefacts and those associated with children, uh, can indicate militarization by exclusion of other activities. Um, so by investigating the spatial distribution of artefact classes standing as proxies for militarization, relative to known archaeological features and more recent non-archaeological military structures, I hope to investigate the relationship between archaeological resource management and training practice. Uh, so ignore all the text, that's just an example of the sources I've been using. Management context was determined through a review of plans listed there, um, and planning applications, time depth was added through archival research, and it was all represented spatially in a GIS. Um, my field methodology was simply a walkover, wherein I systematically recorded every impact and artefact, obviously military or otherwise, on each transect, in a sample of areas in the live and dry training zones. And I was confounded by the sheer amount of material in this apparently quite empty landscape. We also used a transect survey strategy for our primary field work, covering some 25 square kilometres um, of, the, of the ranges. Uh, the work was undertaken between master students undertaking the, the, doing the landscape um, uh, MA at Sheffield and a external consultancy unit, Arc Heritage, who undertook the work as part of the Welsh Uplands Archaeology Initiative. From 83 sites in the HER when we started, there were 1,540 by the end of it. But we began with a tour from a local enthusiast, Keith O'Brien, who pointed out for us the observation posts, <coughs> the remains of early field telephone system, and the gun parks. And this was the ruinous, largely intact artillery firing range and militarised layer in the landscape that I guess we'd expected to find. But as we progressed with the survey, we were finding many more sites that slowly began to make sense for evidence of a more varied and ephemeral military activity. For example, low banks and platforms built into the scree above Llyn Gain. They as may as easily have been ad hoc shelters for shepherds were it not for the relative freshness of the stone. However, once we began to think about where they were situated and observe cases where they were clustered together, then distinct groups of firing positions could be discerned. These groups needed a different survey strategy. We needed to kind of get our eye in and record them analytically. And here on the steep slopes of Kumkine, a small defensive position had been established with six firing positions noted in orange um, around the head of a shallow re-entrant. So as we walked and noticed more, so a finer grain became visible. 
This wasn't about bringing in materials such as steel, concrete and timber to construct angular and alien forms. It was the more subtle reshaping of the landscape, making use of materials to hand and practices almost discern indiscernible from the shepherds that had sheltered in the hills centuries earlier. Um, yeah. in, in my fieldwork too, features would often emerge um, only from a certain angle and after close inspection. So if you can see that sort of un unimpressive shallow divot in the ground was actually someone's bedroom quite recently, or their tea room at least, in front of a World War I observation banker, which is in turn in front of a um, Bronze Age camp. Um, so, Following um, Andrews and others, I tried to take an explicitly theorised approach, incorporating field analysis and reflexivity into my survey process, but attempts to categorise and interpret these distributions <coughs> quickly proved my five initial categories there to be vastly insufficient. Um, unanticipated interactions emerged as I became more familiar with the landscape, such as this uh, obsolete bunker which has been modified into a target that is encountered by troops <coughs> as they leave a close quarter um, battle range. Um, so I encountered numerous recent but obsolete military features which may be considered archaeology in addition to the 600 plus sites already known up to World War II. Both non-archaeological military features like this one and non-military archaeological features show signs of being incorporated into training practice. Uh, so for example Beacon Hill Can was being heavily modified by rearrangement into Sangers until it was fenced off in 2005. You can see one of the shelters there in the centre of the can. Um, it, in December 2015, a survey recorded no further disturbance of the stones, but during my visit, I found evidence of continuing but adaptive use, uh, used as a firing point since at least 2015, <coughs> as the bullets in this bag or a head stamp, 2013, and ignore my thumb in the picture, but that's the out of bounds fence there. <coughs> so, oops, I've missed the slide, oh well. Um, so going over my finds database, I coded each find and feature by the military archaeology interaction it represented, which uh, draws on grounded theory, a sociological method. Some places accumulated multiple codes as layers of interaction built up over the years and persisted in the archaeological palimpsest. The interactions and impacts identified in the themes and inferred activities began to show a directionality of impact that suggested that militarization was not the simple top-down process those five initial categories had imagined. Okay. <coughs> We've talked about militarization so far in terms of what was added, what is visible, what is there, <coughs> not what is missing. A key aspect of the militarisation of Kumkine were, were absences, the absence of farms. At the beginning of the 20th century, there were at least 11 occupied dwellings in Kumkine, marked on this, um, on this map, all of which were farms of varying sizes. There's now one. Artillery fired into the heart of the valley does not sit comfortably, which is a bit of an understated metaphor, alongside the valley as a working agricultural landscape in the centre of this range map. Oops. We have a danger farm. <coughs> as with other training areas in the UK, including Sennybridge and South Wales, where the process is very well documented, the War Office requisitioned farms and land in Kunkine and moved the inhabitants elsewhere. For the first two years, families moved to safety in tents erected outside the range during firing. But this was hugely disruptive, understandably, especially so during the summer, which was both the main firing season and the time when farmers wished to cut and harvest hay. So in this <coughs> piece from the Cambrian News in 1905, the commandant at uh, Trosvenith said that tenants are becoming more and more extortionate in their demands for user rights and it would be more profitable to see the last of them. It takes several hours to clear them off the range, and in the event of firing being abandoned in the morning due to mist or rain, it is not possible, without keeping the inhabitants out of the farm the entire day, to take advantage of the weather should it clear up later. 
To get full, full value out of the range, it is peremptory to clear its inhabitants. In 1905, when the camp moved closer to Kumkine, the farms were given notice to quit. According to the oral history of Betty Wynne Lloyd, the family stayed locally, although the valley was emptied of farms and became, in her words, a scarred and featureless landscape. The military then <coughs> deliberately levelled the buildings, either directly or through targeting with artillery. And it's maybe instructive to draw a parallel with Epent, which is where Senny Bridge is located, which in, 19, uh, in 1940, which the War Office claimed it had blasted into wilderness, or so Plaid Cymru reported. Um, the OTA doesn't have the same narrative of aggressive clearance, but military use has not gone unchallenged. Um, the Audubon Public Inquiry in 1997 aired arguments for and against the intensification of training on the OTA by introducing the MLRS and AS-90 heavy weapons systems at a time when many civilian groups felt the defence estate should be reduced. Military geographer Rachel Woodward considered this an example of the MOD using the narrative of stewardship to defend against civilian attempts to reclaim land, as those quotes she selected have shown. Um, ultimately, the development was approved, and now these weapon systems are other actors in the landscape and the soundscape of the Northeast. So if you're there in February, it sounds really impressive. Um, as travelling sound connects the OTA <coughs> to the coast, military, civilian, recreational and farming practices connect to create the arch archaeological distributions I've just observed. From the top down, management plans do protect specific monuments from heavy impacts. These sites are actively monitored and maintained, and training exercises are diverted around them. This is militarization through stewardship. Some unprotected sites are preserved through record and then left to become part of the training landscape, along with the unrecorded post-World War II military features I encountered. So stewardship is necessarily selective. But from the bottom up, Individual soldiers, commanders, farmers, and civilians interact with the archaeological landscape in different ways to produce a hybrid material culture of militarized rurality. Um, so some protected sites experience transient ephemeral impacts from individual soldiers. So this scheduled Neolithic can um, is protected and fenced off, but a soldier launches illuminating paraflares beside it, um, and they drop the cartridges just inside the fence it's also used as a point on a night training mission, with that actually attached to the out of bounds star post. Um, but in the same place, um, so in the unprotected areas, troops fortify the shelled remains of medieval earthworks with sandbags and make no distinction between a medieval bank and a recent crater. But in the same place, if at different times, sheep shelter behind a target panel, motorcyclists tour the forward operating base, builders scatter debris, grazing and forestry maintain useful training environments. Both top-down and bottom-up military processes militarize the archaeological landscape in particular ways, but farming, civilian work, and recreation also constitute this hybrid rural space. <coughs> we began by questioning whether militarized was a binded assemblage of materials and institutional rules that are put to work by the military in order to make the landscape suitable for training troops and weapons. Military geographies and environmental managers have variously framed this perspective in soft or hard terms. Stewardship soft, control hard. But narratives of stewardship control can be argued to serve particular agendas, the benign landowner or the landscape blasted into wilderness. They also serve to bracket off the military material and practice from the landscape and from rural life. Militarisation might, using this perspective, have little to say about rurality. <clears throat> Our dialogue about our ongoing research revealed a much more messy, hybridised and processual understanding of militarisation. It is one that is revealed through relational theories and archaeological methodologies. We describe landscapes that were inevitably and persistently transformed through military training and through which new forms of rurality came into being. And yet militarisation was and is not a process that is purely in the control of or conditioned by the military. Militarisation is a process that creates distinctive realities through intersections with civilian ways of inhabiting the landscape. But where does this take us? What are these distinctive ruralities? 
We've touched on several during the course of the paper and we'd like ever so briefly to highlight them as our conclusion. Each we think deserves further thought and research. There are the simulations through which troops experience the Transvaal in southern Snowdonia and trained to stay alive in Afghanistan on the Northumberland Moors. These draw upon the characteristics of the landscape and they become, in the case of the, F in the forward operating base, everyday landmarks for farmers and recreational users of the range. There are distinctive temporalities of the militarised rural landscape. The war games stop for lambing and haymaking, while farmers organise their routines around live firing. We noted the more porous than expected boundaries between military and rural life. The ranges were, and are not, fenced in, with the consequent mixing of material culture that Chrissy identified in her survey. And there's the resilience of farming life, and in our cases, hill farming in particular. The history and continuity of sheep grazing is needed to maintain a landscape that's suitable for training. There's been plenty of change, certainly, but in the past hundred years, hill pasture continued as much despite as because of militarisation. The farmers in Otterburn teach their children about how to stay safe in the range by taking them to watch the controlled destruction of unexploded ordnance. So, is it, so it is to a resilient morality that we dedicate this paper. Thank you for listening. Thank you.